test, 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 test. There we go. All right, so my name is Brandon Roney. I'm the Next Generations Pastor here at Concord. And uh, before we get started, i got two guys I want to introduce to you real quick. Their names are Andrew and Wyatt. So y'all give it up for them, guys. Y'all, y'all just right here. Come on. Y'all come on up. So uh, as they're making their way up, i got a photo I want to show you real quick. So guys, y'all, y'all can come up here and stand beside me. If you would put that photo up from this past Wednesday, if you don't mind. Do we have that? Yay, nay, I think we do. There it is. All right, so uh, this is uh, our high school and our middle school ministries uh, this past Wednesday. We were actually across the street at what was formerly known as the Dip. Uh, Now, if you probably, you remember this place uh, as like this kind of nasty gym. Um, uh, It's been renovated. And so our our high school ministry is going to start uh, meeting over there on Wednesday nights. And the reason that we're doing that is because this past Wednesday night, uh, we had 139 uh, middle school, high school students and adults all in one room. So that means that we don't have enough space for middle school, high school, and our adults to meet downstairs in Refuge, the building that we finished five years ago when we, uh, when we renovate, when we finished that facility down there. So I just want to say, God's at work and doing some neat stuff, and I want to share a little bit about these two guys up here. So y'all come on over here for just a second. Uh, to my left right here is Mr. Andrew, and then this is uh, Wyatt. Y'all say, hey, guys. No, y'all say, hey, guys. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, uh, back in April, uh, Wyatt right here uh, was here on a Wednesday night, and uh, Mason Ellis, who is our volunteer student director at our Habersham campus, he happened to be preaching uh, on a Wednesday night. And so uh, after Mason was done preaching, uh, he gave an invitation, and Wyatt was one of the uh, folks in the room that looked at Mason and said, you know what, I need to give my heart to the Lord, I need to turn from sin and follow Him. And so uh, I think it was maybe that Sunday or maybe the Sunday following you got baptized as well. And so it was really neat to see how the Lord's been working in Wyatt's life and what he's been doing. And uh, really neat to kind of hear some of the cool stuff that's been going on in his life as well as some other friends. Well, this past Wednesday night, we're hanging out after uh, we were done with our Wednesday night worship uh, over across the street. And I was talking to Wyatt as well as this guy, Andrew. And we were just talking and uh, I was uh, meeting Andrew because this was his first time coming. And so we were just kind of getting to know each other. And then all of a sudden, after, as I was talking, Wyatt looks over and points to Andrew and says, Hey, this guy got saved Friday night. I said, Hold on a second. What, do what? This past Friday night. And so I said, Explain to me what happened. And so you told me that Friday night, y'all were at a tailgate before the White County football game. And this dude led you to Jesus, right? <laughs> so, I mean... You know, I, I'm standing there, and I'm like, Lord, what in the world am I even doing here? You know, for, that was the, kind of the big question. But uh, what I was reminded of is the power that we have in just inviting people to church and the power that we have in just taking opportunities in life to be able to share with one another. So, Wyatt, way to go, man. Andrew, we're glad and excited. I think you're going to get baptized maybe next Sunday. Yeah? All right. So, good. So, y'all give it up for them. Thank you, guys. Y'all, y'all have a seat. So just wanted to uh, just wanted to share that story with you. It's really neat to see what's going on uh, in, in the hearts of our students and what God is doing. And so uh, very excited about that. So if you would turn to your uh, turn with your in your Bibles to John chapter eight, and I want to um, start off by saying that this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at the entirety of the chapter in John chapter eight. So. I need a favor from you. Uh, I, a couple of things. One, if you will, keep your word, your copy of God's word open at all times, if you don't mind, because I'm not going to read the entirety of John chapter 8. I'm going to kind of walk through it, and there's going to be times when you're going to need to reference it, because I'm going to say, look in verse, or hey, jump back to, and so it's going to be important that you kind of keep your finger there, because not everything is going to be at the screen all the time. But to start off this morning, I just want to read a couple of very important verses from John chapter 8. As we kick things off. So if y'all would stand with me in honor of God's word. And we'll go to John chapter 8 verse 31. So John chapter 8 verse 31. Hopefully you've got it in front of you. Now I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. John chapter 8 verse 31 it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. If you abide in my word you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how you are moving in the hearts of our students. We're grateful, God, for how you are changing lives. And God, we pray that this morning as we look at John chapter 8, that God, we will see uh, just the the truth that is there uh, and it will change our hearts, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. If you guys want to have a seat, please do. 
So uh, if you've ever been on a road trip before, uh, you have probably experienced uh, uh, something similar to probably what this little girl is experiencing in the back of the car, wanting out, wanting to get there, wanting to make it. If you've ever gone with your family or especially with children, uh, you know that road trips uh, can be quite daunting. In fact, you've probably experienced something similar to this video. So if we'll roll that. All right, hit it. Move him on, hit him up. Move him on, hit him on. Move him down. Right. Hit him on. Hit him up, hit him up. Move him on, move him on. Hit him up, roll high. Light him up, move him on. Hit him up, hit him up. Move him on, roll high. Knock him out, count him dead, make him tea, buy him drinks, meet the mamas. Milk come hot, raw, high. Yeehaw! Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? Not yet. Hey, are we there yet? No. Well, are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? Yes. Really? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No, we are not. Are we there yet? No. no. Are we there, are we yet? there yet? Hey, that's, hey, not, that's not funny. Hey, that's really not immature. Really immature. See, this is why you nobody, like nobody ogres. likes ogres. All right, you're All lost. Right, you're lost. I'm gonna just stop talking. Finally. But this is taking forever. Shrek and ain't no in-flight movie or nothing. The kingdom of far, far away, donkey. That's where we're going. Far, far away. All right, all right, I get it. I'm just so darn bored. Well, find a way to entertain yourself. <sighs> <sighs> oh, for five minutes, could you not be yourself for five minutes? So uh, the famous question: Are we there yet? And if you were, if you, you know, at some point, as you being a child, going with your family, that was a question that we all asked. And for me, one of the common responses, and maybe you got a variation of this response when you said, "Are we there yet?" You would get back some variation of the response: "We're almost there. We're almost there. We're we're almost there." Now, if you're eight, nine, or ten. That has no relevance whatsoever to your concept of how much longer it is going to take. When you say almost there, you have no idea. But in life, there, there's a lot of almost there's that happen. You know, if you think about it, you're almost there in the amount of money that you've saved towards that goal that you have. Maybe you're almost there towards uh, getting that promotion to your job or you're almost there and actually getting to retire. You're almost there thinking that, you know, you got one more year of graduation and that one class sneaks up and you realize, hey, I got another year before I graduate. Whatever, whatever you're almost there is, whether it's horseshoes or hand grenades, somebody is almost there. You know, but this morning I want to look at when we look at John chapter eight. I want to point out an almost there that is very dangerous to be stuck in. And so, at the beginning of John chapter eight, we have this uh, this discussion, this dialogue between Jesus and between the Jews, um, particularly the Pharisees and the scribes. And so, when we pick up in John chapter eight, what's happening is that during this time there is a festival going on in Jerusalem. The festival is called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And so that meant that there would be Jews from all over the land that would descend upon the land, the city of Jerusalem, and they would be there to celebrate this feast. Now, the Feast of Jews was to commemorate the uh, was to commemorate the time of wandering in the wilderness after the Jews had been led out of the out of Egypt uh, by Moses. And so this is where we find ourselves in the middle of this story, starting in verse uh, I'm sorry, starting in chapter seven, all the way um, more than likely to the end of chapter nine is where this time frame runs. And so the beginning of chapter eight, we get that Jesus is about to start teaching again. It says that Jesus went away that night and then he slept at the Mount of Olives. And then after sleeping at the Mount of Olives, he came and he returned to the temple and he began to teach again. And so what we see is that Jesus is teaching again like he did every other day. But this day starting off was a little bit different. And if you've read this part of John, you'll know that there's a situation that occurs as Jesus begins to teach. 
that kind of piques our curiosity uh, before he really even gets into the meat of his sermon. So as he's teaching, all of a sudden there before him is a woman that is brought by the scribes and the Pharisees and thrown at his feet. And the, the Pharisees say, Jesus, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. The law says that we should stone her. What is it that you say? Now, if you look at the text, you'll see that the reason that they were saying this is they were trying to test Jesus and catch him. Because if Jesus would actually said, yes, we should use the law and we should stone her, he would actually be, in, be inciting mob rule which was against roman law or if jesus said well let's not stone her he would have been going against jew jewish law so he would have been wrong either way and so the woman is thrown at the feet of jesus which if, if you think about it for just a second this is just a little bit scandalous in the fact that like there is a woman being used by the pharisees and the scribes to be able to catch jesus and the way they're using her is by catching her in adultery first as it is and so he's thrown, he's, she's thrown at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus looks down at the woman, and then he begins to kneel, and then he kneels down, and he begins to draw in the sand. Now, we don't know what he starts to write in the sand. Let's not get into that. Let's, maybe he's just doodling, okay? But he begins to draw in the sand, and then uh, he says, look, let you, who is without sin, throw the first stone at her. And so the Jews stand there for a little bit longer, and then, so then Jesus bends back down and starts to draw on the sand again. And then all of a sudden, it says in the text, it says, at hearing this, at hearing Jesus say this, one by one, they started walking away, the oldest to the youngest. And so you can imagine at this moment, this woman is sitting before the feet of Jesus, and she is embarrassed in her sin. And Jesus says, if there's anybody around us that doesn't have any sin in their own life, then you can go ahead and you can throw the stone and... All of a sudden, you hear the stones start hitting the ground. And then before long, the woman looks around, and there's nobody there but her and Jesus standing before her. And what's amazing uh, is that Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, Lord, there is no one here. And so and then a really neat, very short sentence, Jesus says, well, neither she has, Jesus says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said back to her, he says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And so all at this moment, in the person of Jesus, she met grace, she met mercy, and she met conviction of sin. And she went about from that point. We don't know what happened. But what's interesting to note, as we're diving into John chapter 8, and we're going to get to that point that I talked about almost there. But as we start John chapter 8, what we see is that in the midst of Jesus' teaching, Jesus actually had a time that we, he was interrupted and he took time to minister to somebody. And so there's one important truth that we can glean from this before we get any further into this story that's happening in John chapter 8 is that interruptions can be life-changing. You know, a lot of times we think about interruptions in life, how they're an inconvenience to us. Someone interrupted our day, someone interrupted our work, someone interrupted our meal, someone interrupted our drive. There was this thing put before us that we thought maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. And, and, you know, you've, if you've done this before, if you've ever taken time to minister to someone in the midst of your work, in the midst of what you're doing, in the midst of your daily life, and you've seen the Lord bless that, you know that interruptions can be life-changing. And at that moment for that woman, that interruption that Jesus had in his ministry was life-changing. Because in the person of Christ, she met mercy, she met grace, and at the same time was strangely convicted of the sin that she was living in. And so after this, this short, this sweet interruption in the life of Jesus and his ministry and the teaching at the temple, he began again teaching. And this is where, uh, if I can just kind of just tell you, this is my favorite chapter in, in all of the New Testament. The reason is because from here at this point, after Jesus has this interruption, all the way until the end of verse 59 of John chapter 8, we have some of the richest, really most vibrant discussion that we see between Jesus and the Pharisees. And so it says in John chapter 8, verse 13, and again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, this would have been a very interesting statement. Uh, this is a very interesting statement for us because when we hear this, we think of the, ante the, the, you know, the antecedent to light is dark. So we think of this concept. Okay, Jesus is helping us understand that he is the light to the evil darkness that we see in the world. But to a Jew listening within this context, it is very important and even more drastic because what's happening at this time is the Feast of Tabernacles. And at the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would light these lampstands. And these lampstands were to, uh, were to sim symbolize 
the light of the pillar of fire by night that God led the people of Israel through the wilderness. And so when Jesus not only says, I am the light, but he says, I am the light of the world, what Jesus was actually doing was he was equating himself with God. So not only was he a good moral teacher, as some of these people were starting to accept, but he was actually claiming to be God because the only other person that could actually claim not just to be a light to guide other people, but to be a light that could guide the world, that was a name solely devoted only for God. And Jesus was making that statement. And so at this moment, this began this tension, this back and forth, almost like this tennis match that you'll see back and forth between the Pharisees and the scribes and then Jesus back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so Jesus begins to talk about his relationship to the Father because he begins to explain, look, what I say, I don't say of my own accord. This is what the Father has given me to say. And then, uh, you know, and, and then so the Pharisees ask a very important question, well, where is your Father? Jesus keeps talking about this Father. Well, where is your Father? And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to understand, okay, well, who is your dad? Where is he? Show us some proof because what they had said is, look, you're making testimony about yourself. Now, if you're going to make a claim the way that you're making a claim, then you need to have somebody else to back up that claim because you need more than just one witness to claim the things you're claiming to be. And so Jesus makes the statement. He says, look, I'm claiming... My claim is enough, but my father, he also gives testimony to me. And then that's why the Jews say, well, where is your father? They're like, hey, well, well, let's prove it. Let's show somebody that can testify the way that you're testifying. And so he began to say these, uh, he began to talk a little bit more about their father. And he talked about how well, he's going to eventually one day go back to the father. And where he goes, the Jews, they can't go because um, they're not of the father. They're not of the same family that he's of. And so they're starting to get really confused because Jesus is starting to say some things that they're not sure that they quite understand what he's referring to because they're thinking on this level of living here on earth. But Jesus, we know, is thinking from a heavenly perspective. That when he returns and that when he's lifted up on the cross and then when he's resurrected and he returns, he's going to return to heaven. He's going to return to be with the Father, to reside at the right hand of God on the throne of heaven. And so they don't understand all of these things. And so they continue to question Jesus back and forth, back and forth. But then uh, near, the verse, uh, near verse 28, 29, and 30, what you'll begin to see is that there's a group among them that begin to believe Jesus. And what he said. Now pretty much the only big thing that Jesus has said at the moment is that I am the light of the world. He's equating himself with being not only the light for people, but the light for all people. He's equating himself to be God. And so this is really kind of the biggest statement at this moment that he has said. And then we see in verse 30 that as he was saying these things, that there were many who believed in him. So up until this point, as he was saying these things, the ones that we've just mentioned, many believed in him. And so this is where Jesus dials it up just a notch. Because he sees that there are some people buying in to what he's saying. So it says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. Now at this moment, if you are... Um, if you are a disciple of Jesus, in other words, one of the twelve, um, at this moment you're like, yes, Jesus, you've got him on the hook. You're, they're believing you, they're buying in, and at this moment, if you were a disciple, you're watching and you're thinking, we're about to, we're about to like double, triple, maybe even quadruple our following right now. Like they're thinking there's about to be a revival going on, and then Jesus says something very, very contradictory to what the Jews believed at the time. So he says, to those who have believed in him, if you will abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now at that moment, like I said, there were some that were buying into what Jesus had said. They had believed him. According to what John had said, John saw that they were believing in Jesus. So when they were believing in Jesus... The act of Jesus decided, all right, I'm going to turn my teaching up a notch. And so if you abide in my teaching, in other words, what has, what has already happened, and then now what I'm about to say, if you will remain in this, then you will truly be my disciples. And when you're my disciples, you'll know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. And so this is where things got chaotic. If it wasn't already crazy and the tension hasn't already been building since chapter 7, when Jesus began teaching in the temple during the festival of booths, this is really, it really got interesting because the Pharisees looked at Jesus and they said, well, um, 
we're offspring of Abraham. Y'all know Abraham, father Abraham had many sons and many sons had father Abraham. There's a song we had to make it so we could remember. But they said, we're the offspring of Abraham. How can you say that if we're the offspring of Abraham, who is free, then how can you say that we will be free? And this, they're still thinking in an earthly context. And so it's back and forth again and again between Jesus and between the Pharisees. And they're wondering, you know what, how in the world can, can you say we'll be free because we're not, we're not slaves to anyone. And then Jesus goes on to explain that, look, if you're a sinner, then you are a slave to sin. And so Jesus was trying to help them understand that anyone who, is, who has ever sinned is a slave to sin. But they were like, oh, 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 oh we're, we're not slaves. We're, Abraham is our father. They just kept getting caught up on this concept. And so then Jesus said, look, okay, if, if, if your father and my father were the same ones, then you would know me and you would love me. And so then they started getting real confused because then they're like, okay, well, if he's saying that Abraham and us, or if he's saying us and Abraham don't have the same father, then is he saying that we don't even know our father? Are we illegitimate children? And so they make that comment. We're not illegitimate children. We know who our dad is. It's Abraham. And then they say, even God is our father. So what, what are you getting at, Jesus? And so then this is where things for Jesus get dangerous. Because when they say, we have one Father, even God, and just a few verses later, Jesus says, look, your Father is the devil. Now, I don't know about you, but if you tell a bunch of God-fearing, very religious people, you're the spawn of Satan... I don't think it's going to go well. In fact, you can tell that it's, uh, that it's not going well uh, even before that because it's, Jesus says in verse 42, Look, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he who sent me. And then Jesus asks a question that he doesn't need, he doesn't need an answer to because he knows the answer. He's like, look, wh- look, why do you not understand what I say? And this is kind of something that my wife does. She'll ask a question of me, and then she answers it for me. And Jesus does the same thing. Jesus asks a question, and then he says, It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. The reason that you can't listen to what I'm saying, you can't bear to hear my word, is because you and I, we don't have the same dad. And then verse 48, the Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And so it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The Jews can't get over this whole father thing. They're thinking from an earthly perspective. God, Jesus is thinking from a heavenly perspective. They're all confused. And so finally, I love what they do here. They change the subject. Have you ever been in an awkward conversation before and all of a sudden you just change the subject? You know, you start talking about like football. And you know, aren't we glad football has started? Well, I mean, my word, yeah, we got more class for that than other things. But, I mean, but you know, you, you get in that awkward conversation and you change the subject. You're like, so, um, how about the Falcons? You know, you, you start trying to find new things to talk about. And so the Jews at this moment try to find new things to talk about. In verse 48, it says, they answered him, are we not right in saying that you were Samaritan and that you have a demon? I mean, out of left field, right? And then you go a little bit further in verse, 30, uh, in verse 52. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. At that moment, what Jesus did is says, if anyone will believe in my words and abide in my words, they will never see or taste death. And at that moment, the Jews were were, were really confused. They're like, hold on a second. How can you say that if somebody will abide in your words, they'll never taste death because if you are from father abraham and we're from father abraham or so we think based off of what we know then how can you say that they will never taste death because even father abraham died or their, their question was are you more important than abraham and so they're stuck on this conversation of of abraham and jesus and how these two relate and then jesus makes a very profound statement and says Look, Abraham in his day would have been excited to see what you are now seeing. In fact, he even saw what you are now seeing. In other words, he's seeing the fulfillment of the ancient of days. He's seeing what is supposed to happen at the end of days. He's seeing God come in flesh. And so the Jews don't quite understand it. And so they ask Jesus, uh, how is it that you say Abraham has seen these days... Because 
you're no more than 50, and there's no way you know Abraham because Abraham's dead and he was living a long time ago. And so this is where Jesus makes his second I am statement. If you get to the end in verse 58, Jesus said to them, Look, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, at that moment, what Jesus was doing was echoing the words that God told Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses asked God, when you send me to the Pharaoh, when you send me to the Egyptians, who should I say is sending me to them? And that's when we get the famous statement where God tells Moses, tell them I am is sending you. And that's where we get the word Yahweh from, the word I am. When we see that, we're we're given a name of God. And so when Moses was given that name of God, the I am, tell them I am is sending you. And then Jesus is echoing that in this verse in chapter uh, John chapter 8 and verse 58. What Jesus is doing is actually saying that I am the I am. And at that moment in verse 59, it says that they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And there's a lot of people in, our today, in, in today's society that will want to look at the life and the ministry of Jesus and everything that he taught. And many folks will say that Jesus never actually claimed to be God. But in verse 58 and 59, we actually see that there is hard evidence that Jesus made this claim. Because there would have been only one thing that the Jews would have picked up stones for to throw at Jesus. And that would have been for blasphemy. Blasphemy on what grounds? The fact that Jesus was actually claiming to be the I Am. And so at that moment, what is interesting is that in verse 59, the same stones that were dropped in verses 1 through 11 of John chapter 8 that were picked up to throw at the woman who was caught in adultery, the same stones that were dropped in that context were the same stones, more than likely the same stones that would have been picked up by the Jews in verse 59 to throw at Jesus for blasphemy. However, what's even more interesting is that those same stones and those same people are the same people in verse 30 and verse 31 that John says that had believed in Jesus. And if you follow the the train of thought through there, you'll see that the context and the setting never changes. That there's no new group of people, that nobody's moving away and moving out, that Jesus doesn't move to a new setting. That at that moment in verse 30 and verse 31... That there is a group of people that at, to an extent and in principle had accepted what Jesus had taught up until the point that Jesus began to say that he was indeed God. And so what that shows us is that it is possible to accept almost everything that Jesus taught. That it's, it's very possible for someone to accept almost everything that Jesus taught. And this is what happened to the Jews. They had accepted almost everything that Jesus had taught. Because if you go back and you look in verse 31, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. So here are the words that Jesus said to the Jews who believed him. He said, Look, if you abide in my words, and we see that word abide mentioned again so many times throughout John, especially if you read John chapter 15, where Jesus says, if you will abide in me and I in you, you will produce much fruit. And he talks about this whole concept about how disciples are those that actually abide in Jesus. They remain in Jesus. They remain in the full, uh, in the full, um, to the fullest extent of Jesus' teaching that those are his disciples. And so in verse 31, when we see that there's a group of people that believe Jesus, Jesus dials it up a notch and he says, all right. If you've bought into this, then if you will remain in what I'm about to say, then you are truly my disciples. And what we see is is really a, a devastating picture. And it's a dangerous picture. Because we see a group of people that were almost there. They, they, they almost made it. They had almost bought into everything that Jesus had said, but then at that moment when Jesus actually claimed to be God, that's when they checked out. 
They were okay with the light of the world. They were okay with some of the things that Jesus was teaching. They were okay and ready to admit that he was a prophet, that he was a good teacher, that he was a moral person, that he was an okay kind of guy. But when Jesus actually made the claim that he was God, the same group in 59 that picked up the stones was the same group in verse 31, was the same group in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. And they were almost there. And so there's a lot of people, maybe even some in this room today, you're almost there. You think maybe Jesus is a good moral person, Jesus is an okay teacher, Jesus was a pretty good guy, you know, by all historical accounts, we can't prove that Jesus wasn't real. By all historical accounts, most, most scholars would say that Jesus was a real person, that he really lived, that he taught in the first century, and that he was uh, alive during that time. And so you might be here and you might be almost there. You're willing to accept all of that about Jesus. But the one thing that you're unwilling to accept, the one thing that actually is what belief in Jesus entails, is that Jesus is not just a good moral teacher, is that Jesus is Lord. That he is God. You know, in the beginning of John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. The word that John is using to describe what is, is, is the word that we understand now to be Jesus. And he's saying the word, Jesus, was God, was with God. He was with God in the beginning. He was, he is, he will always be. And so at that moment, those Jews were almost there in their belief in Jesus. Some were even having conversations among themselves throughout the, throughout the New Testament and other parts where you see, you know, maybe he is a prophet. But they were unwilling to accept that he was Lord. You know, and, and so for us in the room uh, that, that haven't accepted Jesus Christ and the Lord, that, that is the appeal to you this morning. That you would see that Jesus is the fullest imprint of the nature of God. That there is nothing about Jesus that is not God. That he is God. You know, and, and he didn't leave that open for us. We see in the scriptures that he didn't leave that uh, it didn't leave that choice for us to say to be able to accept some things about Jesus and not all things about Jesus. I love what C.S. Lewis said. If we could put that quote on there, C.S. Lewis said, and he was a 20th century theologian who used to be a former atheist. He said, "I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing that they must not say." A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Through Jesus' life and teaching and testimony about himself, he did not leave it open for us to judge whether or not he was God. He made it clear. And so if you're here this morning and you're almost there, if you haven't made that final step, of moving beyond accepting Jesus as a good moral teacher or an okay person, but you're still not ready to accept him as Lord. I want to ask you why. How, what, what is it? How can you move from being almost there? Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to come see uh, Pastor Levi at the end of the message and talk about, look, I've, I'm, I'm almost there, but man, I, I, you know, I, need, uh, I, I need some help. And then for us in the room who are Christians that have accepted the fact that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus is God, we've put our faith and our trust in Him, you know what? Let's be honest with ourselves. On this side of things, it's a little, it's, I would say it's probably easier for us than the Jews that were in the first century to accept some of these statements that Jesus is saying because we're post-resurrection. We get to see the validity of Jesus' testimony to the fullest through the resurrection. And so we see that and we're like, yeah, we, we don't have near as much of a problem accepting that as the Jews did because it doesn't go against our natural context that we live in every day. But, however, there might be some other things in Jesus' teachings that we're not so willing to accept in our everyday lives. Love your neighbor as yourself. Pray for your enemies. Give out of your poverty, not out of, out of, your, not out of your excess. 
And so if you're here today and you're not a Christian and you're almost there, I, I, I pray that you would see that Jesus did not leave it up to us to decide who he is. He made it very clear. And maybe there's some other things that, as a Christian that you're, that you're not living up to, that you're, you're accepting some things about what Jesus said, but you're not living out all things that Jesus said. Not that, does, that, that doesn't, make you, doesn't make you not saved, but it's just that Jesus has called us to follow all of his teachings. And a disciple is someone who abides in all of his words. And so if you're almost there, what can you do? How can you move from being almost there? Let's pray. Father, even now, I pray that you'd move in our hearts. And we thank you for your word in John chapter 8. Thank you that we see that you are gracious and that you are merciful. And at the same time, Father, you are willing to call out our sin. So, Father, I pray that you would uh, open our hearts, open our ears. Thank you that you would allow us to use and read your word together. And then we pray. Hey, heads bowed, eyes closed across the room. If you're here this morning and you know that you're not a Christian, you know that you're almost there. You've never accepted Jesus' free gift of salvation. You've never, you've never moved from, from disbelief to belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But this morning you have. If you know that it's not up to us, but it's up to Jesus. And Jesus made it very clear that he is the way, John 14, 6. If you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as the only way to God, as God himself, I want to invite you to do that this morning. We're going to be at the front. Pastor Levi and I would love to talk to you about that. Would love to talk to you about that decision. And also, if you're here this morning and you want to join our church, we'd love... Uh, when people partner with us in ministry together and getting them uh, plugged into the different places that we have to serve here and uh, all for the purpose of making disciples everywhere. So whatever it is you need to pray about this morning, whatever it is you need to talk about this morning, we'll be here at the front. So as I say a word of prayer, if you would uh, stand with us as we go into our time of invitation. Father, thank you for what you do in our hearts. And uh, Father, how you teach us through your word. And we pray. Amen.